First, I want to thank uh, Antec for having us here today. And I was trying to figure out what I could possibly say. You guys have been sitting here for almost two days now. Right after the break, I get to come up and try to say something that you're going to need to be remotely interested in after all this, this time, but I'll try. Um, I, I need to warn you, I have two warnings. One, uh, I just figured it out it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, my time back home. And so I may not be on my head. Second, I, I was a Marine for a very long time in the United States, uh, American Marine. So if you ask really, really difficult questions, I'll just wave at you and ask for the next <laughs> question. <laughs> Let's talk just really quickly about venomics. I know that you've heard a few times people mentioned venomics during the last couple of uh, the sessions and, and some things that we talked about. Uh, basically, where venomics came out of, there was a four-year engineering university up in uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps, retired from the Marine Corps, joined the university, and basically, as we say in the United States, to herd the cats. And what I mean by herd the cats is we had a bunch of PhDs at this university that had a whole lot of um, really great ideas but never got them out of the lab. And so I kind of came in and they asked me to work with uh, uh, our Department of Defense to try to take some of these good ideas out of the lab. And, uh, we originally were doing work on maintenance, so our emphasis was on maintenance and making sure we did predictive maintenance for vehicles and that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of money put into that research. And then um, we were able to get them out on vehicles and then I, this is a true story. The company started because some young Marine, uh, after I finally convinced all these PhDs and doctors to take their technology and put it on one of our Marine vehicles out in the field, we got it all out there. We had it out there for a month. We put all these wires and gizmos and, uh, on there. And this Marine took this vehicle out and managed to sink it in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and uh, about 100 feet down. He got out, everybody got out of this vehicle. But then all of these uh, scientists were yelling at me, all my stuff is gone, everything's gone. But they had pardoned it, and we were actually able to get the data off of it. And once we got the data off of it, we were able to tell the story about how this vehicle sunk. And the story that the Marine told, what he did, didn't quite match up with what we found out. You know, he wasn't supposed to go too quickly into the water. This was a a vehicle that was supposed to float coming out the back of a ship. And because he ran it in there so hard, he managed to drive it down into the, into the <coughs> ocean. So uh, our company really literally started at that because then we were able to get that data and then the military said it was like a black box like on an airplane, we want this. And so then they bought it. And uh, the university a year or two later made the decision that, hey, we need to separate you guys out. And so we started up a company to work on this. Uh, in, back in 2010 is when we uh, started up. We started to look around who had um, the same problems that the military did. You know, they had their vehicles go far away and they could break down and it was really serious. Um, and we looked at the commercial trucking industry and that's what we picked to start to look at you know, what we may be able to do with this technology. As you can see, in 2010 we had our first customer. It was kind of a, what we call a friends and family customer. Was, uh, a buddy of mine who had a, a little dairy truck thing where they went around and picked up milk. I convinced him to put this stuff on there. And then we went for about two years without anybody else buying. It was because my pitch to everybody walking in was, hey, if you put this really expensive piece of gear on there, we're going to prevent you from ever having another truck failure ever again. And you may be able to tell that story to the military guys that don't want to break down in bad guy country. But for trucking companies are like, oh yeah, right, you're gonna save me lots of money because I'm gonna buy this thing. And so we couldn't really prove it, but what we realized in that two years is we had a lot of data about the driver, how he drives the vehicle, we're just collecting it as a byproduct. And, uh, and that's how we happened on fuel. And then the stars really aligned, that was when we also uh, first got introduced to Advantech. And so between Advantech and uh, and having a powerful computer that could actually read that data that was coming off, we started to have some success. And so now we're in 2014, and from that original dairy farm company that had 10 trucks, we're now at about 15,000, and we'll be at about 20,000 in the next uh, six months for us. So that's the quick story of what we got here.
what's our true north? Uh, you have a saying uh, in the service that you always want to let, make sure all your people understand where you're going. So this is kind of our where we're going. What, what we do is we take all that data that we collect off those trucks and we, do, uh, we try to give useful information to our customers and we try to do it in real time. So we'll talk about one application that I think uh, translates outside, well, outside the United States. What we do is something called in-cab coaching. But the idea is we take that data and we try to make sure that we can impact decisions where it matters. Um, so you can collect data, and then two, two weeks later or a month later, you can provide a report. And it's, the report says this driver wasn't driving well or this driver was driving uh, inefficiently. But that's two weeks old now. What you want to do is impact that driver as he's driving so you can save the fuel right then and there. Or you want to impact that driver as he is um, doing something unsafe. You want to impact it there. And that was kind of the basis of what we try to do with our system. And now that IoT is really coming to fruition and some of this technology is really coming to fruition, we think there's much, much more value that can be created um, from trying to transfer information back and forth very quickly and in real time. So we, uh, we have a patented uh, uh, algorithms that we use uh, that basically follows this simple path. Determine what is happening in that vehicle at this time. So we look at all the things that we can assess that's going on. What is the driver doing right now? Uh, we try to understand from that where he's gonna, what he's going to do next. You know, if he's, he's starting to enter a hill, what's he going to try to do? Is he going to try to downshift or upshift? <coughs> and then we try to determine based on an ideal what he should do to get the maximum value out of that vehicle, whether it be fuel or safety. And then we try to gently guide that driver into that so he's doing the right thing. And when I say gently guide them in, we literally uh, do not, for example, send a tone off every time we expect him to shift. What we do is we wait till he gets to a certain criteria and then we warn him. And the system works so that if the driver never hears our tone, then he's driving well. And so they, that's a good incentive. You know, I don't want this thing banging off of my ear, so we try to make sure that he does that. And, and again, we use the same methodology, not only for coaching the driver in care, but some of the other things that we do, which is we look at the truck, we look at the condition of the truck, we try to identify how or things that we can change about the truck that will allow it to uh, be used more efficiently. We can talk more about that as we go along. This is the system as it is uh, right now on this 15,000. Obviously, we're transitioning like many of you as uh, Intel gets out of the out of business from the, we have the uh, Trek 550s, and we're going off to the, what we call the Trek 572. But basically, our system, sorry, system consists of the uh, computer that we add on. Now we do this in a number of ways. We have installers that go out and add it on trucks that are already running around. Uh, we've had some success now, particularly with some of our larger customers. I think our largest one has 9,000 tractors. We have another one with 4,000 and we have some smaller ones. Uh, at the manufacturer, we're now a part number and they just stick it on for the, when they buy a truck, they, they add on our stuff and connect it right in so that we don't have to even mess with it. Um, that sits on, we have a touch screen, which is the 303, for those of you who recognize it, the driver uses it to interact. And then we have our, our uh, customers uh, interact with the system in a number of ways, but primarily through a web services site that has a set of standard reports, and then there's some customization that they can do on that website and draw the data out. So we coach the drivers, for example, for fuel. Anything that we show them in the cab, that data is available then for their managers and supervisors. Uh, many of the companies uh, incent their drivers so that any savings that they get as a company, they give a percentage to those drivers. And let me tell you, that brings them right on board. Now in the United States, we have some strict regulations on how much or how long a driver can drive, and they used to keep logbooks. And in fact, the running joke in the industry was they called the logbooks the funny papers or because no one ever kept their log exactly. And the change in the regulation in the next year is going to require that all truckers that drive over 100 miles from home days will now have to have some sort of a computer on there that automatically tracks that. So our system is already set up to do that. 
And again, the drivers actually, at first, they, they didn't like it because they thought they would get in trouble, and now they really like it because most of the people that stop them, when they see a computer in the truck, they realize that the driver can't mess with it, so they just push them on through. So many of them now are not getting stopped and harassed as they're, they're going down the road. Uh, the big key thing, though, is the back end there, uh, the Dynamics Database and Alex Analytics Engine. We collect a lot of data off the trucks. The Advantec that we have with the vehicle interface actually collects every single bit of data that goes across that CAN bus and storage. It stores that data, and we bring that off. And anybody that wants to know how that's done, I'm certainly willing to uh, tell you how we do that because uh, let me tell you, I have a lot of scars on how we store all of that data because once we did it at first and then our customers tried to access it, it took them hours to get it out because it was just so much. So we, we went through a lot of iterations on, on how to store that data. And that's one of the things I'll talk about with IoT. That's a really big challenge that I don't think has yet been solved. So here's some of the applications. We'll talk about one specific one further on. The in-cab advisor is our driver coaching. That coaches them on fuel efficiency or, or progressive shipping for anybody that understands trucks. It's a way to make sure that they're in the right gear so they're the most fuel efficient. It does, uh, it does warn them when they're doing things unsafe with the vehicle, whether it's going too fast or braking hard or going around a curb. Uh, again, we use the accelerometers are in there to warn that driver when he's putting the, the truck in an unsafe condition. Um, we do a lot of vehicle efficiency analysis. Another great area that I'll talk a little bit about, which I think the data is going to help. So imagine this. I now, as a, a company, I know what loads exactly how much they're going to cost me in fuel and in time. And I make make decisions where I might say, you might show up to me as a customer and say, hey, I've got a load for you. And I, I can now do a calculation based on that to say exactly how much that's going to cost me and whether or not I should even entertain you know, taking that load on or how I should expense it. Two, being able now to match my truck fleet up with the loads that I have and the areas that I need to go and, and, and put those loads on those trucks that are better suited for the weight that they're going to carry as opposed to others. And it's a very, very uh, dynamic science that's going to be really good. And then there's a number of other applications. We do the normal stuff, navigation, route tracking, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's something that's kind of interesting in the middle there. Many of you may not be familiar with it. Uh, in the United States, we are required to do a vehicle inspection and actually record it. You know, they have to write it out, record it, and they have to carry it with them. So if they get stopped, they then make the driver go around and show them that he's done that. Uh, we've automated that system and made it electronic so the driver does it through the touch screen. And the reason that's good is, when he starts to notice things wrong with that truck, that gets pushed back to the maintainer who's responsible for that truck so he can be ready to make the fixes or order the parts so the next location that he ends up at, he's going to have a good chance of getting that thing correct. And so that's very important. So how is IoT transporting, uh, transferring, um, or transforming the IoT? The trucking industry was used to be like this kind of mom and pop kind of industry where you had a guy who had two or three trucks or five trucks. It is now becoming much more complex because of the regulations that are coming out, because of the expense of these trucks. We're starting to see larger and larger fleets. There are very few fleets now that are one, two, three, four, and five. And there's a lot more fleets now that, I mean, I have fleets now that we're interacting with that have 15,000 trucks, 25,000 trucks. You know, and those are becoming much more complex. So. Um, they really need ways of kind of tying that together. The other big thing is this industry is starting to understand that there's a lot of economy of scale and things that you get by just collecting data, making small changes. So for all of the work that I do to save fuel, um, on average, anybody have a guess of how much fuel I can save just by doing progressive shipping? What is the percent you think that I get? Okay, hazard a guess. On average, I say between 5 and 7 percent, and some places down to 3 percent. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have an 8,700 tractor fleet, that's $35 million a quarter. That's how much they're driving. So, I mean, it, it can be just small changes now, and it's very important. So, uh, obviously, uh, it can affect a lot of things. What are the big drivers in this industry now? 
I'm not going to repeat all these things because many of them they've talked about in the past. You know, you got these connected devices, cloud computing, all these things are kind of facilitating it. But there's two things that haven't been talked about a lot, particularly in the industry that I'm in, transportation, where you don't have a lot of young people driving yet. You know, you have a lot of older folks. The average age of a driver in the United States is over 45. So these are not tech savvy people, but now as they age out, we're starting to see younger people come in. So I think that's one of the important things. You have tech savvy employees or drivers, and their companies are becoming much more tech savvy. Before, everything was done on the back of a pencil. Now they're, they're willing to accept this, and that's why we're starting to see a driver. And then as I said at the bottom, more complex entities. Uh, I will get, I will make a brave guess that probably five years from now there will not be any fleets that, that are successful that will have it less than 200 trucks in the North America. It's just become too complex of a business. And the federal le le legislation has made it too difficult. So that's kind of what's driving us into this IoT environment. Obviously everybody's heard the statistics, I'll jump through that quoted Intel about six times today for 40 billion in 2020. The key thing though that you need to understand is IoT as it's can it's just not as we say the kids say it's just not a bunch of cool apps. You really have to demonstrate to these more sophisticated companies that are really going to gain stuff. You really are going to have some things out there. So some of the early adopters, here's the things that have really resonated with them. And those of you in the transportation industry that are maybe in a less mature market you need to start to think through some of these things. The big one, that first bullet up there, increased fleet utilization. I went to some of the largest companies uh, in the United States, some pretty sophisticated companies, and I asked them two questions. They said, one, what is your mileage across the fleet? And more often than not, they had no idea it's just too complex. They've got drivers that are pulling fuel from fuel fuel tanks that they own as a company to drivers on the road pulling fuel. They just had no idea how much fuel and what kind of mileage they were getting. And the second one was how often are your trucks being used? One of the biggest problems in the United States for these large companies are they have tractors out there that are getting hardly any mileage and they don't know about it because they have these large complex um, organizations that are geographically separated and if I have my little truck thing and I have an extra truck in the back there I'm not going to make it known to corporate because they'll pull it from me so they have no idea that it's there and the second big one and this is going to sound even more nuttier is the biggest problem today for some of these large fleets is they have trailers out there and they have no idea even where they're at they've lost them uh, one company that's very very prominent in the United States has lost eight percent of their trailers they don't even know where they're at Eight percent. Of course, when you have 15,000 of these things, it's easy. But how does that happen? A lot of these guys with these new routing protocols, they're meeting up in the middle of a highway. One guy is dropping a trailer off here. Another guy picks it up. They don't meet up one day. That trailer gets dropped off empty. The other guy drives through because he's got a load he's got to go pick up. And then all of a sudden, that trailer sits there for long periods of time. And they forget about it. And it's a, it's a very interesting problem. Again. If you can just find those trailers for them, they'll be very excited. So we put <laughs> sensors on the trailers and we interact with the trailers so that when the trailer gets dropped, at least they know where it gets dropped and goes. So fleet utilization is a big one. Shorten the lead time between equipment breakdown and repair. Uh, I, I really was not as savvy when I got into this marketplace. The big problem is not a truck breaking down by the side of the road. They have ways to take care of it. What do you think the biggest issue is when a truck breaks down by the side of the road? It's actually the load in the back. How do I get it, particularly if it's a perishable load, how do I get it off there? I may not have any trucks from my fleet there. I've got to interact with another trucking company to get a truck out there and everything else. So that's a big deal for them. So we look a lot at the maintenance of that truck, the things that impact the maintenance of that truck. We look at all the DTCs that go through and by that, and we pass that on back to them in real time. So that when they have critical items that are getting ready to go, and you get a lot of fair warning in a lot of these breakdowns. There's very few catastrophic breakdowns that just break and there's been no warning. There's a lot of information going across that data bus inside of that truck that's there and available to you. And um, uh, we use that to warn them. 
we actually, every 45 seconds on the truck, we send a signal off, and, it, and so within about a minute and a half, our customers will get a little buzz. The guy that's responsible for that truck that says, hey, there may be a problem on the E, and uh, it's very helpful. And then there's other things, the accurate cost of delivery, determine the most profitable load, and select optimized equipment. We do a lot of work now with customers on, here's the types of trucks you should buy based on the loads that you pick up normally. And here's the trucks, here, they take their fleets that are always mixed fleets because they've acquired fleets or they've got stuff, and we say, if you have this type of load, this is the best truck to do it. And so they're, we're doing a lot of that matching of trucks to their loads to make sure it's uh, um, cost effective. How will it transfer my thing? Right now in the United States, there's a lot of proprietary stovepipe systems, right? There's PeopleNet, there's Qualcomm, my competitor, there's mine. They all look different, they all don't talk to each other. The world is changing with IoT. Everybody's gonna be talking to everybody. Um, most of the emphasis is on machine to human applications, interaction there. That's gonna change, because now with the Internet of Things, you have connected things. Machines are gonna be talking to machines outside of the human, and, it, and it's gonna be very important in my industry. Can you imagine if I have trucks that have cargo on them that talk to my truck to say I'm on here, the truck then transfers that information off and as I'm pulling up to one of these sophisticated warehouses that we were talking before, the warehouse is getting a heads up that this is inbound, here's the things that are on there, and then they start to they start to prepare to unload that stuff. And me, I want to know what weights in the back so that I can adjust the characteristics of the truck to get even more monitoring. So as items are removed and no longer reporting, I know what the weight is in the back of the truck. I might adjust my coaching techniques for that. So there's a number of things now. And that's going to have to happen automatically. Those are machines or sensors talking to other sensors. Right now, uh, almost all of the telematics in the United States is done after market installation, meaning that the truck is built and it's put it on. That's going to change also. There are now OEMs that realize that their customers want these computers on there. Why don't I just put them in there and integrate them right into the truck? Similar to uh, you know, satellite or serious radio. You know, you put it in and then all of a sudden it downloads the, uh, the software they want. So open IoT platform is absolutely critical because as customers buy stuff, they want it to talk to each other. And I just don't want to have to buy the Venomics coaching system. I may want, you know, a RAM McNally mapping or routing. I may want um, some other maintenance thing and I want them all to work together. So much like your phone, where you have a bunch of apps on there, that's kind of how we believe that this is going to be delivered. Machine to machine, and again, OEM installed. This is the other big change in the industry that I think is coming. I have 15, 20,000 trucks running all over the United States and all in Canada and down in New Mexico. Those are now big sensors that are running around out there, generating data for not only my customers, but maybe data that is sellable to other people. So for example, I know the weather everywhere. So who needs to know that weather? I know um, the traffic conditions. Are there people that are using routing software that would want to know the traffic conditions? Can I sell them that information or can I pass on that information to make their stuff better? Um, accidents, I know when they occur. I have cameras out looking at them. There's sensors. What can I do with that information? Uh, infrastructure health. This is a big one. In the United States, there's a lot of talk about our bridges and our roads and infrastructure and its problems. My trucks drive over these bridges up every day. They have accelerometers. Maybe there's changes in the in the conditions as they run over. Is that an early warning that that may be a bridge that needs to be addressed? So there's a lot of those kind of sensor applications that are out there that exchange data is going to be very important. So we look at our trucks now as just big sensors with a lot of little sensors on them. And that's the way we got to start thinking about these edge devices. Um, that's kind of a summary. I want to make sure I stay on time here. Uh, open open Arcture will allow fleets to select best in breed. I'll now start to, just like my, uh, my uh, Android applications, I can pull the ones that I want tailored for me. A lot of the industries want to be able to do that. Um, there'll be operational insights that were never available before. I'll know exactly what goes on in that truck. I'll know exactly what goes on in the back of that truck. I'll know it across my entire fleet. And I'll have that information. I'll make good decisions when I buy new trucks. I'll make good decisions on whether or not I price my loads correctly. There's 
all kinds of things that I'll be able to do with that. Leaks will have the opportunity to sell their data back to the IoT cloud. They're going to have a lot of information that others are going to want. Um, IoT will facilitate autonomous or driver-assisted technologies. Everybody's talking about how uh, uh, there's these, uh, you know, uh, what is it, Google's running their car around and there's a couple of these things. Do I think they're going to be able to replace the driver? Look, I've been through this before. You know, they built these great big ships, they built a lot of equipment that reduced the number of military guys you need on. The problem is you still need someone to maintain those, you still need someone to stand watch. You're still going to need that driver to service that customer, make sure that he's out there engaging that customer. So yes, you may be able to move some of this frames without a driver on board, um, and IoT is going to facilitate that, but you're going to still need that human interface there as part of that. And we're already starting to see it with this connected car. The trucks are going to join that ecosystem. Um, and you may actually uh, have interactions between car and trucks. There's a great, great, I think I put it up there. Oh, yeah. This is one of the great um, uh, new kind of neat, sexy things that I saw come out. Talking about the connected car. Uh, if you look over on the left here, that guy's got a helmet on. It's got a couple of sensors on there. And as he's riding along down the road, uh, I think it's Volvo has come out with, if, if the car senses that sensor, it puts a little warning that there's a bike up right next to it. And uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction between cars and other cars to do things like accident prevention. Uh, there's a company out there in the, in, the, in the United States right now that is talking about platooning of trucks where the front truck will transfer information back to the back truck. You'll actually be able to get those trucks up close enough together where they can save fuel on that back one. Yet, when that front driver puts his foot on the brake, the brake will automatically engage in that back truck without any uh, driver intervention. So there's a lot of these that are just on the, the crux of coming out that are going to make it much safer industry. What are the challenges in my industry? The big ones are legacy products. There's a ton of trucks and there's a ton of product already out there. Um, those are going to be around for a long time. How do you get them integrated into this? How do you kind of up, upscale so they can take advantage of some of this? The long tail. Uh, and what I mean by the long tail is there's a lot of still small companies out there for the next five, six, seven years as the regulations uh, get stronger and they're not going to be able to survive. But until then, you've got to figure out how to get this technology down to the, the driver with one or two or the owner operators as we call them in the United States. Uh, there's too much data. This was my biggest challenge. What do I do with all this data that I'm collecting? I collect more than uh, 500,000 to a million miles worth of data every single day. I think it's a terabyte of data every two weeks. How do I organize that data? How do I access that data quickly? Where do I put that data? Those are very, very difficult questions. And, and when you start to look at some of the frameworks of uh, uh, the NoSQL frameworks and the non-time series frameworks, there are there's solutions out there. But this is a big challenge. And particularly as you are uh, thinking about your business, how do I serve it up in a way? So I may be able to look across the entire fleet, but it takes an hour and a half to run that report to give to that customer so we can look at it. It's, it's not very helpful to them. They're not going to like it. Um, standardization. There really isn't any real true standardization. There's people like Intel and some of the others, IBM and Advantech are, are putting this stuff up. But there's no standardization. How do people exchange data? And not only how do they exchange data, let's say you have useful data, I have useful data, and we want each other's data. How do we enter a contract really fast? So that I pay him for his data, he pays me for my data, and then all of a sudden you jump in. Do you pay him? Why pay him? How do you contract that stuff? How does that happen in real time? It's, it, that problem has not yet been solved. And then security, obviously, that's always in the back end. Uh, I was very surprised. Originally, you know, I thought, who cares about the route of this truck? I mean, what, what's, you know, okay, so what? This truck's running on the road. Who cares? Who's going to be out there trying to, you know, capture that information as I'm setting off the truck? Well, we've learned that a lot of people care. We've been, we've been attacked twice into our network, which causes some issues. So we put a lot of security. But a lot of the companies now, the routing that they do, particularly like uh, what are the waste management company today? Waste management companies in the United States, their most valuable IP is the routes that they take to the customers that they have. And so they want that to be kept secret. They don't want their competitors to know. And so security has become a big issue. 
Um, just quickly, this is uh, uh, we are entered into an, uh, uh, we're entering in and we're uh, in talks with Advantech to allow our coaching SDK be uh, part of the uh, hardware suite that they provide for our uh, partners in other uh, other regions outside of North America. What does uh, this driver <coughs> performance look like? This is what we show them in the cab. It's very, very simple with a touch screen. We use the track in here. Uh, it basically provides that driver a, a fair analysis of how he's driving. So what do I mean by a fair analysis? The big bugaboo in the industry has been, I'm driving and I'm hauling feathers on flat ground. Yeah, sure, I can get seven miles per gallon or I can get a good score. Unfortunately, you on the other hand, you're hauling bricks in the back, 25 zillion tons, and you're going up hills, but I'm getting seven miles per gallon, you're getting five, guess who the better driver is today? Me, because I'm doing better, right? But uh, we have now come up with a way to actually give a score that talks about how I drive versus how I ideally could drive, and it makes it fair between the drivers, and um, this is, this is the interface that you get to kind of understand what their score is. We look at shifting and some other things, and you can see it's pretty, pretty visual. It tells them everything that they want to know. How does it affect it? We, can, we do a fuel gap analysis. So this is not only for the driver to say, you could have done this, and you're getting this. Here's the gap. And then you can try to go after that saving by driving better. But the companies then can also get a true reading on how much, again, that, that load costs them. They price well where they can turn business away that's just not going to make them any money at all. We do a lot of benchmarking across fleets. So we have a lot of information about fleets. So a new fleet comes into us, we can benchmark them and say, compared to everybody else, you fit in this way. And we can also benchmark their drivers. In the US, we have a huge driver shortage. Um, we just don't have enough people driving. And uh, so how do I know which drivers that I want to keep? This is one of the ways that I can pay them and bonus and make sure I keep my drivers that I really want to keep and I can train up the drivers that I, I may have a problem. And then vehicle efficiency. Uh, vehicles, select the right type of vehicle to make sure you maintain it because again, it's one of the focus areas that we try to do with our, our coaching and our, and our fuel outlet. Here's some of our successes. Uh, this is uh, some of our fleets over the left there, Conway Freight, that's the one that has 8,700 tractors. They're getting about 5%, huge amount of money for them. Uh, Side is another one of our big ones. They have about 3,800 tractors. Uh, they've got a huge, and then we go all the way. You can see some of them, uh, there's a little one, a company called Ron Gross over there. Uh, they only had about 50 trucks. They've almost doubled it now. They were getting 70% savings. Now, why do you think they were getting 17%? Those were not getting. They do a lot of shifting, they do a lot of heavy hauling. <clears throat> what they were doing were they were incenting their drivers, they were paying by the amount, I can't even imagine, they were paying them by the amount of fuel that they were using. <laughs> I don't, don't ask me why. Well, that's a great incentive, you know. Guys were idling on the side of the road because they finished early driving fuel down. It's just crazy. So uh, these are the type of uh, things. So, I just uh, briefly, we're, we're working with Advantech now. This coaching algorithm and some of this tool analysis and stuff, this is going to be a package that uh, we're going to uh, offer as an SDK through Advantech. Uh, there's tiered licensing and stuff. Uh, I can talk about that in anybody's interest. Uh, we'll make it available both in Linux and Windows versions. And we're going to, we obviously have it for the 550 because we've done it. We're putting it on the 570 and then we're going to target the 674. And 773, but obviously if there's anybody out there that is using a product for fleets. Now what type of fleets does this really have the biggest impact? These are fleets that carry weight and they shift a lot. So pick up and delivery local or um, you know, uh, uh, carrying uh, large uh, equipment. We have a lot of Caterpillar dealers in the United States that are using our stuff because uh, they carry a lot of weight and drivers really matter when they're shipping. Did I make my time? Good. 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 Question. May I raise a short question? Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about um, IoT transfers, um, the market, you said uh, it will change from aftermarket to the OEM. Correct. Um, does it even mean that you will 
change your sales behavior that you will address uh, the truck manufacturers, for instance? Yeah, in fact, um, the, the foot and door is uh, our truck manufacturers, like uh, we have a couple of big ones like Volvo and stuff, they actually offer us as a configuration that we can put on there. But it's still aftermarket. They build the truck and they stick this on there. But we think that there's going to be truck manufacturers that are going to get on board with this, just like the car manufacturers done, and they're going to actually install. So we've given fair warning and advantage because they need to be in there um, talking to these guys to make sure that it's their type of equipment that's getting on there. But, but uh, we eventually see that our business is going to be purely software as a service, similar to a phone. You know, there's a bunch of software as a service. We see that it's purely going to happen, and we're going to be uh, having to ride on these uh, on these trucks, whatever kind of computers and stuff that we're on. What the advantage we get with Advantech is they have a lot of ruggedized stuff, and, and as he was talking about this morning, is uh, it, you know it's a very extremely harsh environment. Uh, and harsh in a number of ways. The, the most harsh part of our environment is, is temperature and the vacuums. Um, and uh, we have had trucks that start all the way down. And we, we have 12 volt systems in, in the United States for our trucks. And we've had trucks start all the way down at six volts um, under cold weather and conditions of you know, 20 and 30 below zero Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, it, you have to have that starts it up in, in more than five like So uh, it's a very harsh environment. So the truck manufacturers understand that, so we think eventually that's going to be good. Yes? Now you were talking about the data for managing. How to handle not disclosing <coughs> sensitive information about the vision you are sharing with all the products? So you have to think through that. So the first big thing you have to do is you have to make sure you're entering good contracts with your customers that they understand. They own the data and you have to be able to do it. And then as you uh, organize your data, and these big data, you need to make sure that you have a way to sensitize or the, de 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 um, trying to think of the right word, I, I just had it lost it. You, you, you take the, the customer specific information out and you need to plan for that when you store it, that you have the capability of, of taking that information out. And we, we thought about it after we blew it a few times. I mean, I got scarred and blew it a few times. Um, about it. Now when we pull and exchange that information, we're able to uh, filter that information out so that I don't pass sensitive information about my particular customers off to someone else that may use it for not so good means. Any other questions? I'll be, uh, I'll be around all the way through tomorrow afternoon, so if anybody wants to ask any questions or if you're just getting into this, I, I can tell you I made every single mistake possibly made and then some, so I, I, and I'm, I'm fine to tell you what I did, stupid. So.